So in the previous video, I went over some of the basic aspects of coding, variables, if statements, loops, arrays, and functions. And maybe practice is good to build up intuition before moving on, but making a game is more fun. Like I said at the end of the last video, my game I'm releasing on Steam started in JavaScript, so I'll explain how to build something like that from scratch. When it comes to software like games, the three most important things you have to figure out how to do in order to get the game to run are input, output, and timing. More specifically, how do you draw to the screen? How do you get user keyboard or mouse inputs? And how do we run at a consistent and predictable number of frames per second rather than the code just running as fast as the computer can go? Problem is, this is going to be different for almost any language, but we're learning JavaScript, so I'll teach that. Before doing anything else, last time we were using Notepad the entire time. At this point, I would recommend downloading Notepad++, just something that'll do syntax highlighting because that'll probably really help. So HTML has a tag called canvas. Now, I mean, when we go and render it, it's not gonna look like anything yet, but we'll give it a width. Uh, and we'll give it a height. And uh, this is what we're going to draw to. And um, if you add a little style here, this is CSS styling, uh, you'll see the border around it. So that's our object. Not that we'll actually need that. Um, anyway, I'm just gonna try and make the simplest script possible to basically just get anything on the screen. So here's our uh, document.getElementById. And then honestly, I don't even like know what this is. I mean, I copied this from Stack Overflow a long time ago. Uh, and then I just copy it from each project to the next. Um, but I guess this is getting a context, which is what you actually draw things to but I don't know if there's like other kinds of context besides 2D. Maybe there is. Is there a 3D context? I, I don't even know. Uh, so then fill style here. This is just defining the color that we're gonna draw with. Uh, this is in hex encoding. Um, usually you might see hex encoding and it would look like this and you can define it as six characters or you can define it as three characters. I do three just because it's easier for me, but um, if you wanna do whatever color you want, just search color picker online. Uh, and, uh, oh, you see, you know, Google is gonna give you its own color picker here, and then you could just copy this code and paste that there, in quotes. Oh, crap, damn it, what the, how did I launch big picture? Why, why do I have a button on my computer that launches big picture? How do I get out of this? Uh, and then, Lastly, and all we have to do is just draw a rectangle on the screen. And we're just going to draw it across the entire width and height of the canvas here. And there, we drew the color green. So we got a color. The last statement tells us to draw it. This function has four parameters, x, y, width, and height. Here we drew the rectangle to be the size of the canvas. So it just covers everything. Um, but we could have put this rectangle wherever we wanted. You can see that's the case because we could just go and copy this and make another rectangle. So uh, let's, uh, let's just put it, I don't know, somewhere else. This is width height. So we're gonna make a 100 by 100 rectangle and put it at say 100, 100, why not? And, oh, because it's green, right? We got to change the color. Yeah, let's make the color blue. And see, no, why is it not working? What is wrong with me? Why can't I ever do anything right? Oh, because, yeah, I drew the other one on top of it. See, this is, this is, I, just, I don't, what am I doing? Yeah, so order matters. Uh, anyway, we could draw more rectangles. We could make a face. Okay, um, and then this, no, okay. There, we did it, we made a face. So great, um, we can draw, but this is all static. How do we get things to move? And so let me um, 
let's simplify some of this right now. Yeah, so I just simplified this back so it's just one rectangle. Um, so how would we get this one rectangle to move? So you could say make um, this first 100 here, which is the x position, you could make this a variable, right? You could say this is equal to 100. So you could make this variable x here, and then theoretically you could then go and increment this. Um, but it would zoom off the screen faster than you'd even be able to see it because code these days goes really fast. Um, and we need things to go at a consistent pace. We need things to be controlled. So what we can do is JavaScript has this function called set interval. And the way that it works is it takes in a function and then it takes in uh, a number of milliseconds and it will run a function every certain number of milliseconds. So what's interesting about this is you'll see that a function can actually be passed as a parameter and stored as a variable. Um, so why don't we call this function paint screen and we'll call it every 100 milliseconds. So it'll draw to the screen every 10 seconds. And now we're just gonna have to put uh, this code that we just wrote into a paint screen function because that's what we just called it. Uh, and now let's take our declaration of x out of the function or else it'd be getting reset to zero each time. Um, and at the end of this function, we'll increment x. And now that we do that, I think that's all we need, we should start seeing this uh, rectangle moving across the screen. And so we do, but it's stretching. Uh, and so the reason for that is that we're not clearing the screen each time we're drawing. So if we add back in this rectangle, um, you'll see that it actually just moves across the screen. So key thing there is that you just need to draw over everything again, every single frame, which is what we're doing because it doesn't clear itself on its own. So great, we've already got two of the three things that I said down, uh, output and timing. So all we gotta worry about now is input. So now what we have to do is we have to add something called an event listener. Uh, and again, I should mention that this isn't stuff I memorize. This is stuff that I just look up every single time that I do it. Um, and luckily I can just refer to my old code, which is what I did here, right? So we added um, an event listener called key down and we're now gonna create a function called key down. You may have to declare it above this statement or else the function wouldn't be defined. And for right now, let's just set X equal to zero. So that way we don't have to worry about specific inputs. It just means that any key we press will set X to zero. So let's see if that worked. And yeah, it's working. So unless you're making Flappy Bird, we're probably gonna need more than that. So this key down function actually does take in a parameter. Um, it's just a key event as it's called. And uh, that event um, has a property called key code, which is really all we care about. And the key code is just a number that the computer assigns to each key on the keyboard. You could go and look up those key codes online, but you could also just output it to the console like this. So save, refresh the page. So right click, inspect, and um, go to the console. And if you click on the page and then you start typing some buttons here, you'll see that when we press a button, we're getting a key code. Um, and so what we want are the key codes probably for left and right, because we wanna be able to move the square left and right. So left is 37 and right is 39. So make note of that. And so we could just start saying something like events.keycode equals 37, you know, check to see if it's 37 and then put our code in here and then say X minus minus or plus plus or whatever to increase or decrease the value. But imagine you've got 10 buttons that you're gonna be pressing and it's gotta be checking that every frame and Sure, we live in the year 2022, and honestly, that probably won't slow things down, but it is inefficient. You know, there's no reason to be doing a big if else tree here. So what you can do instead is you can use a switch statement, which is a little bit more complicated, but it looks nicer for one thing. 
and it runs faster. And so the way that it works is just um, it'll jump straight to the number of the case that you put here. And then it'll run the code after it. So because 37 is left arrow, we want to decrease x. And 39 is right arrow, we want to increase x. But switch cases are kind of weird because if it jumps to 37, it won't stop. It'll just keep going down to 39, and then that will cancel out moving left. So that's not good. So we need to add this statement called break. Um, and let's do it for both of them. And what break does is it just immediately exits the switch statement. Um, break is also useful in a while or for loop, because in that case, it immediately ends the loop. Get rid of x plus plus down here. And if we save and refresh the page, you'll see that if we keep tapping right uh, over and over and over again, we're moving to the right. And if we keep tapping left over and over and over and again, we're moving to the left. So rather than incrementing and decrementing x uh, here in the key down function, we're just going to uh, create some variables up here uh, called left and right. Uh, and these are using booleans, so they can be either true or false. So you want to say left is equal to true when you hit left, and you want to say right is equal to true when you press right. Great, awesome. Then let's just make some logic in this function. Uh, you could say left equals true, uh, or you could just say left. So if left is true, then we decrease x. Uh, and if right is true, then we increase x. And great, it works. Problem, uh, it doesn't stop moving right when we let go of the key. And if we press left, uh, both left and right are true, and it'll never move again. So we need to add another listener. And luckily, it's really easy. Just copy paste this statement, change key down to key up. See this key down function? I know I said earlier copying and pasting is bad, but I mean, look how easy this is. Come on. Maybe get rid of the console logs. Anyway, yeah, so same thing, but now we're setting left and right to false. And so now, key up is not defined? What do you mean key up is not defined? Oh, because yeah, I didn't change it. Right. Okay. Okay, yeah, so now um, we can move left and right extremely slowly. But, 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 we do have rudimentary input, output, and timing. You know, really, um, you can do practically anything now. Rest is just logic. But, um, okay, let's go clean up some stuff. Okay, so first thing, I'm going to put set interval uh, in the key listeners and everything. I'm going to um, put this in, um, in window.onload function. Um, uh, and the reason for that is because that's how it is in my own code. And I'm sure I had a good reason for that at the time. No, but like actually, I think the real reason for this is so that everything will be defined uh, before we call it. So that lets us say take these key up and key down functions, and we can just move them wherever you want in the code rather than them having to be defined sequentially. Um, and uh, also to be clear about what window.onload is, it's just a function that runs once the page has completely loaded. Okay, now we're going to take uh, canvas and context, and we're going to take them out of here because we want to define them globally like these other variables up here. That way we can refer to them from anywhere. Uh, now uh, we're running at 10 frames per second because we're running every 100 milliseconds. That's not a good number. All right, let's, uh, let's make our FPS uh, 60. So then you just do 1,000 divided by your FPS, and that's the number of milliseconds that you need. OK, let's refresh to make sure we didn't break anything. It moves faster and looks smoother. Isn't, OK, we got to do more. OK, so a game is more than just painting to the screen. It's also the logic. So it kind of doesn't make sense for us to be doing paint screen on a given interval. We really want to just change this to game loop. Right, and so let's make a new function, call that game loop. And game loop will have two parts. The second part is paint screen, so that's like before. 
but the other part will be game logic. So now we got to go and make a function called game logic. This control logic is should not be in the paint screen function, right? It's good to keep your logic and drawing separate because if for one reason you want to do one without the other, you can do that. And you don't have to worry that one is being affected. So our, our character square actually still moves kind of slow. So let's uh, let's uh, add a, a variable here called p speed or player speed, and um, let's let's set it to three, and then we can say x minus equals p speed, and x plus equals p speed. Um, and what's also good about um, defining a variable up here rather than just saying x minus equals three, x plus equals three, is that now we would only have to change p speed in one location to uh, update the character speed, right? Because uh, now we're going to add uh, up and down movement as well, because what good is uh, just moving left to right? You don't want to make a one dimensional game. Now this is another uh, place where p speed appears. Um, so we're going to have to define uh, all of these things here. So yeah, we need up and down and a down var. Uh, and we got to add a y position within key up and key down up is 38 so then up would equal to true down is 40 so then down is equal to true and then do that again for key up and so great look at that we uh wait this isn't working what do, what do i do wrong why does everything hate me Seriously, what the what am i doing wrong oh right yeah duh i forgot uh forgot the y here Okay, great. Yeah, we can move up and down and, and everything. Your dreams of role playing as the DVD screensaver have now come true. So I guess, yeah, let's move on to the one of the most basic and important elements of games, which is collision. So we got to make a wall and we got to draw it to the screen. So, I mean, we could make another variable here. We could call it wall. And uh, we could just go like uh, 300, 300, 100, 100. That could be our wall. And um, see where we paint the screen down here. I mean, let's just copy our code, right? We're just gonna say wall zero, wall one, wall two, wall three. Cause that's, that's what we defined up there. And uh, we gotta make it black. Great, we now have a wall. We can totally just go through the wall. So we gotta we gotta make it so we can't do that. So let's go into my code and uh, copy my intersect rect function. Uh, this function's great, and I initially probably took this straight from Stack Overflow. Uh, so intersect rect. So this function here returns a boolean true or false which we can then go and use in an if condition. The exclamation part up here, that means not. So it just runs um, four checks. And if any of these checks are true, then it knows that we're not colliding, right? Because of this not here. So now instead of just moving the player when they move up or down or left or right, we want to check if they're colliding first. And we're going to do that using intersect rect. But might as well just make another function called is colliding because intersect rec could probably be used for more cases than just collision. So is colliding would take in a potential X and Y value. You know, I probably shouldn't call it X and Y because we already have those. Let's call them potential X and potential Y. And so basically what we're gonna be doing, so just like for example, for left here, right? Instead of just doing X minus equals P speed, We'll first say something like if is colliding uh, x minus p speed as sort of a, a check to check our potential x where we would move next. What's our next position, right? Um, then if we're not colliding, then we modify the x value. And we're going to have to do this for all of these, but let's just do left first. 
so intersect rec takes in eight parameters. Um, the first four are our first rectangle. The second four is our second rectangle. Uh, the first two are X and Y, and then the second two are not our width and height, but actually X plus width and X plus height. So uh, that'd be pot X, pot Y, pot X plus uh, our player width, which I haven't defined yet. I'll go do that in a second. Pot y plus our player height second line so like i said in the last video white space is basically ignored so i could just go on to the second line here without any problems and then this is wall zero wall one wall two wall three no 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 it's wall zero plus wall two wall one plus wall three. And so, yeah, so if the if the rectangles are intersecting, then we are colliding. Um, oh, right, no, I have to define P width and P height. Hold on. Let's change 100 to P width. And over here, P height. And up here, let's just say that our P width is 100 and our P height is 100. So it's the same as before and I broke it. Fantastic. How'd I break it? Unexpected syntax error. Ah, I forgot a closing parenthesis. That is a very common occurrence. But luckily error messages in the console help you with that. Great, okay. So um, when we move left, we should see that it... Why is it not working? Why does it seem nothing so? This is, this is actually very common. Look, I mean, things not working is incredibly common. You just have to get used to it. That's how you code. Things don't work. You wonder what is happening. And you know what? This is a good good time for us to go and uh, try and, and, and debug this here. So let's uh let's go so i paused it here um this is if not is colliding x minus p speed y okay great um so we can we can kind of view what these variables are by actually just hovering over them so we could see oh x is 379 p speed is 3 y is 268 so 300 is not greater than 476, 400 is not less than 376, 300 is greater than 368, no, that's not true, 400 is less than R1U. No, no, none of those are true. Oh, it did return true, oh, okay. They are intersecting. So is colliding should be returning true as well, is this not correct? Oh, you fool. You forgot to put the word return. Yeah. Things you got to be careful. You got you to gotta make sure that you do stuff. That's the problem. Okay. So if we go down here, you'll see that um, we can't go through this. Look, isn't that, isn't that great? We can't go through it. So let's just uh, basically copy this code for the other ones. Okay, there, and it's uh, slightly modified so that it takes up less lines. Now we should not be able to intersect with this block at all. And we can't. Now you might notice that there is kind of a, a teeny gap in between us and the block. And um, that's because we're moving at three speed and not one. So one way you could fix that is you could write a loop and um, have it so that if it does intersect, you just make P speed smaller and smaller until it's essentially just up against the wall. You also might be able to just subtract off the difference 
But that bit of code is more tedious than it is difficult, so I'm going to skip over it because this is good enough. So let's go and add more walls. Because right now we only have this one, but we can turn um, our wall into an array of walls by just adding a couple more brackets here. So here's a long wall going along the right side. Here's a long wall going along the bottom. So we can't just draw one wall. We have to make this a for loop uh, where we increment through all the walls. And then we just add an I in between each of these. And I'm just going to copy that because then when we go up and we do our is colliding, we're also going to need a for loop for that because we have to check all of the walls if they're colliding, which also means we can't return it right away. So we have to say var ret value for return value. We're going to set that to false. And then in the for loop, we put our intersect rect at the Add the eyes for the index here for all of them. And I guess we're going to say if it intersects. Then ret value is true. At which point you could break, though you don't have to. And then we return ret val. So to go over this, uh, we want to know if the player is colliding with any of the rectangles on the screen. So to do this, we have a variable that we're going to return, and this is representing are we colliding or not? That's our return value. Then we're checking each value in turn to see if they intersect. And if just one of them intersects, then we know it must be colliding. So we set our return value to true. Then we break because if one of them is colliding, we don't have to check the others because it doesn't matter because we're already colliding. And then we return that value. So refresh the page. And our new walls are there, and let's see if we uh, if this works. So yeah, we can't go through the walls, so it looks like this is functioning. Our character is not very nimble, though. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna reduce the player size. Let's let's make our player size 70 by 70. Yeah, there we go. Look at that. Look how, how much more nimble our character is now. Now we can go through this little gap right here. So now, But now I realized I don't want to make a top-down game. I want to make a platformer. So now we got to go and add gravity if we wanted to do that. Uh, let's get rid of this up and down logic first. Uh, so this is a different kind of comment, the slash star and then the star slash to end it. This is just in case you want to do multiple lines commenting out all at once. It's just more useful that way. Um, and so now that uh, we're going to actually have real game logic, uh, and this right here is kind of control logic, I'm actually just going to throw, I'm, I'm just going to change this function name to control logic. Um, and then we're going to have another function called game logic. That'll call control logic at the beginning of it. So the way that gravity might work is that we're going to have a new uh, variable here. We're going to call it vertical speed. And unlike player speed, vertical speed can change over time. You might say, like, if not is colliding um, x, y plus 1, so that would be 1 below the player, y plus equals v speed, and v speed plus equals 0 0.1, that's our gravitational constant. Um, I don't know, what's this going to do? It's almost like gravity. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's that's almost working. Problem uh, is that we're now stuck in the ground. Maybe we could do V speed. Hold on. That, that'll maybe stop us before we hit, I think. Right, yeah. And then we could have an else, and then we set v speed equal to zero over here. And that'll have like a weird effect where we'll like, yeah, like slowly dig into the ground. 
and then what we'd say like can jump equals true so we'd create like this can jump variable or something like that so then if we want to do jump we'd also in the same way that we have left right up down we'd have a, a var jump and um, if we want to add jump we go here and we say case 32 because 32 is space and we say now jump is equal to true and, uh, when we go to key up we say jump is equal to false actually you know what um, I think for better consistency with that, the rest of it we could say space actually so then in our control logic function we're gonna say if jump and can jump we're going to set the v speed equal to, I don't know, negative 5. What kind of jump height is that? We'll find out. Oh, we broke it. Great. What did we do wrong? Jump is not defined. Oh, right, because I changed it to space. Sorry. If space and can jump. Yeah, okay, great. So, okay, yeah, so um, problem. I'm never setting can jump to false, so we can just jump infinitely. When we jump, we have to set can jump equal to false, so that way we can't jump again. And we can't jump again. And we get back to the ground, we are able to jump. Oh, this is interesting. We hit the ceiling and then we can jump again. Okay, there's some weirdness going on. I'm holding left the entire time, and we're getting stuck on on here why is that happening that is so weird oh i forgot a break statement okay that explains the weirdness and the weirdness is now gone but you still can uh jump again like that and that's not good okay so first off we're only going to set can jump to true if uh is colliding x y plus one because then we know that the ground is below us we can only we are only able to jump if the ground is below us right so that stops us from being able to jump in midair what do you mean it's broken i hate you all yep uh forgot a parenthesis that's good some of the time but not all of the time like the way that you're colliding with the ground is like you get stopped and then you start again and that's not very good so yeah, I guess you just like say um, for i equals v speed and okay, get rid of this. Well, we, we do want to set v speed to zero, but not yet. For i equals v speed while i is greater than zero, i plus plus. No, i minus minus, we're going to cause an infinite loop. What are we doing? If not is colliding, x, y plus i, y plus equals i, break out of the for loop. I don't know. Let's see if that functions. Ah! Oh, God. Okay. Um, yes, I, I made a typo. Oh, I made another typo. You know what you could do, um, because, you know, a lot of platformers have this thing where um, the longer you hold the jump button, the higher you go. And right now, you might notice that our jump height is the same no matter how long we press the space button. Um, and you know what? I feel like for better understanding of the code, um, we might want to just put this in a handle gravity function. But this might this might be better. So within, con within control logic, um, space is true when we're holding space down, and it's not true when we've let go of it. But I think there's no reason why we should end up going upward unless we ourselves jumped. So that means if we, we could say if, um, if not space and we have negative V speed, or, or actually like if V speed is say less than negative two right then we'll immediately sort of stop the jump by setting v speed equal to negative two um, and that'll let us and, and maybe we should make v speed over here higher 
Um, and let's see, let's see. Oh my god, I keep making this dumb mistake where I spell V speed wrong. So we're probably gonna jump like way higher now. All right, yeah, all right, that's too high. Let's uh, let's go negative six, maybe. I just want to get on this block. All right, that's all. And still not high enough. All right, negative seven. There, good, great, we did it. And um, ooh, look at that. Right now we have variable jump height. Isn't that isn't that isn't that great? Okay, so let me just review this code because I feel like I was figuring this out along with everyone else. So, how does jumping work? So first we defined space, uh, v speed can jump. We went down to key down. When the key is down, space is true. When the key is up, space is false. Within our control logic, if you're pressing the space button and you can jump, which basically just means you're on the ground, then we set your upward speed, your v-speed, to 7, or your upward speed to negative, your speed, uh, we set your v-speed to negative 7, which is 7 pixels upward, and then that slowly decreases by 0.1, right? And then we say you can't jump because you've now left the ground. But if you stopped holding space, um, which might be the, the case in a few frames later, and you haven't reached the point because your, your v-speed is slowly increasing over time. So you haven't reached the peak of your jump yet. You haven't gone above two, right? So at that point, you're still going upward, right? So if you were to release space, like right at the top of your jump, it doesn't make a difference. And that's what that negative two does. Because um, watch what happens when we set this to zero, right? So if we do that, look how, look at that. You just immediately stop. That's not good. That doesn't feel satisfying. So that's why it's negative two. So then in our game logic, we created the handle gravity function. And then within handle gravity, what we do is we check to see if on the next frame, um, you will be colliding with the ground. And as long as you're not colliding, we're going to send Y down by V speed. And we're going to increase V speed by just a little bit, which is 0.1, which is our gravitational constant. Else... And this is the case where you are colliding with the ground. So this should be where you stop colliding. Um, if you ignore this for loop, right, it seems pretty simple because we just say, well, if um, below you is ground, then you can jump because there's two options, right? You could have hit the, you could have bonked this or you can bonk the ground. Um, and we set your V speed to zero, right? And that happens both when you hit the top or when you hit the bottom. And that just means that you'll you'll stop moving up or down at that point. But to make sure that you don't like awkwardly, abruptly stop and then fall some more, uh, we have this for loop, which is slowly decreasing V speed until um, you aren't colliding anymore and then adding that. And you'll see that we have a smooth thing where um, you might have noticed before we like stopped right above the ground and then fell some more. And okay, now we have a platform, we have gravity working. And so there are a number of things you could do at this point. Um, one thing that you could do is you could have the camera start following the player. So if you wanted to do that, you'd have to create a camera X and a camera Y. And then where you draw the rectangles on the screen is dependent on the difference between the X, Y coordinates of those rectangles and the camera. For my own game, each screen is static and when you go off screen, so in this case, when Y is less than zero, uh, then it just goes up a screen. Each screen or each level has its own set of rectangles. So in that way, you're not drawing all of the rectangles all of the time. You're only drawing the rectangles of that screen. And the way that you might do that is see how we have a, our, our wall here like this. Right now it's a double nested array. Well, we could just add another bracket and then make it a, a, a triple nested array. And if you wanted to add enemies, you'd kind of make them in the same way that you made these walls. Um, they could have their own set of array of objects because they would be behaving differently than walls. But uh, essentially if you intersect with their rectangle, then you do some logic, like you lose a life. 
and you know to do hit points or lives you'd have to have like a var hp variable in here a var lives variable and in your game logic if you go about um colliding within the game logic you know like oh hey if i hit an enemy then you know hp minus minus or something like that i mean this is simplifying everything you know these are kind of uh, the basics to get to the point where, you know, you then start using your own creativity to start making things. And I think if you have this basic thing from here on, you can probably start figuring out more on your own. But I figure that I should probably go over um, a few more things, specifically images. One way that we could get images is that we could declare them globally like this. Right, and so p image just means player image. And um, let, let's make a player image, why not? Um, so I like to use GIMP for this stuff. Um, cut to like five minutes later because GIMP is gonna take about forever to start up. Great, okay. Let's add a transparency layer. I'm not even gonna try here. I'm just, I'm gonna make a stick figure. But nah, we're, we're gonna be a wide boy. Right, okay, now let's export. We gotta export it to the desktop so that it's actually in the right spot. And what I say, I call this P image. Um, right, so right now we have this like that. So I think, what is it, ctx.drawImage. And uh, what do we call it, P image, X, Y. Does that work? That probably will work. So get rid of our old rectangle. Yes, we did it. We drew an image and wow, the collision does not match. Is that because our character is 70 by 70 and not 50 by 50? Okay, well, I guess I'm going to end up changing the dimensions of the character anyway. 50, 50. There, great. If you want to do character animation, um, the way that you might do that is you could have a, a global variable blink or, um, you know, just, I mean, sure, why not blink? I mean, even though that's not like necessarily accurate, basically the way that blink would work is that it would um, blink plus equals one on every frame. And then you might say, well, hey, if blink is then, because you want this to repeat essentially. So like, let's say it repeats every 90 frames. You might say, oh, well, if blink is greater than 90, then set blink back equal to zero. But there's an easier way to do that that's a lot faster blink equals blink plus one mod 90. now i love the mod funk it's fantastic um, it's done with this percent sign um, and basically all that the mod does is that it's the remainder so it's going to divide by 90 because this is integer division it's always going to be zero because we're never going to have a number greater than 90. i mean unless it's 90. right but then the remainder is just what remains. So essentially all that happens is, it, is we're going to end up going from 0 to 90 over the course of 90 frames, and then it's going to go back down to 0. So we have a cycle, and that's going to be useful if we want to do animation, because then we can go and change our P image based on where we are in the blink animation. So um, you know what? 90 is kind of too long. So let's have it repeat over like uh, 30 frames, which is half a second. If blink is greater than 30, right? We'd then say p image draw equals p image and else p image draw equals p image two, which we haven't made yet. Let's go make it. But that's, that's fine. You know, it's probably bad to put everything in globals like this because then everything has to load all at once. As long as you're keeping your load fairly small and you're not like making giant, enormous images, it shouldn't matter. And um, you're not moving. Why aren't you moving? Oh, oh, right. Duh. Okay. Yeah. Um, I made it 30. So this needs to be 15. Okay. Right. And now we got a moving animation. You know, what's better than that is we, 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 we only want that moving if we are moving. If left or right then we do this right or else um, we could just set p image to, to, be, to be the default here right so 
There, look at that, look at that. We have an animation. I think also you might want to know how to draw text to the screen. You know, and you could you could Google this stuff. I didn't set a font size, so I don't know how large that's going to be, if it's going to draw anything at all. Wait, why did I do fill rect? I want to do fill text. Oh, wow, okay, it did work. It is tiny though. Okay, the solution is annoyingly ugly, right? You say CTX font equals, I'm just copying this from my other code, um, like 30 do PX and then the font name. So if we want to do Arial, we do that. It's, it's, it's a text string, of course. And yeah, there it is. We did it. Um, you know, and, and to make this more user friendly, you could make a set font function and it would just concatenate this PX and then your font um, with a number that you provide into the parameter. Ah, uh, you know what? I forgot to cover sound. Um, here's a function that I probably uh, didn't write and probably just mostly copied from Stack Overflow. Uh, you could just have Googled this yourself, but uh, I mean, this is a sound function. It's basically entirely self-contained. Uh, all you do is you kind of just load the sound, kind of like you load the image, and then when you want the sound to play, you say music.play or sound.play or whatever the name of your, your, your sound is. And when you want it to stop, you say music.stop. And um, yeah, I mean, I feel like from here, I mean, you have the tools, you know, and you could go off and you could come up with creative ideas. Um, I went totally off my script at this point. What else do I have on it? Oh, oh God. I want to teach everyone how to make a 3D engine. That should be a separate video. So that means it's the end of the video. And it's the end of the video. I've got to plug my game again. Oh boy. Okay, so Collapse Relapse is a game on Steam.